thank you so much for being with me on my show. I'm excited to talk about all things. See, I don't know how to pronounce this word either. Ophal? Ophal? I say awful, which I know, again, like all the puns of like awful, awful. Um, but I think it's like a tomato, tomato thing. I don't think there's like a wrong or right way to say it. I could, I could be wrong about that, but I hear it both ways. All right. So it's like a tomato, tomato sort of yeah, scenario. I think so. I'm good with that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm not going to lose sleep over that. Um, so you've got this new cookbook out, super exciting, uh, in which you do a deep dive into recipes that really kind of place Ofal, awful, however you want to pronounce it, sort of at the centerpiece of the dish, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, it's something that's kind of become increasingly uh, more important in my life and more of a staple in my diet. And as I learned more about it and as I just kind of found more enjoyment and health in doing that for myself, I noticed that people were, um, you know, I'd post about it on social media or whatever, and people would be like, what are you making? And that's weird, but also I'm kind of interested, like, how do you do this? And, and I started to realize that there was a a small but not insignificant group of people who were as interested in this as I was. And I, I think that it's um, an important area of health that's kind of underserved. So I was, uh, I was ready to do it. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's not common, but it's, there's definitely this sort of groundswell of people that are interested. I mean, I think it's sort of riding the coattails of people just generally becoming more interested in health and nutrition and wellness and things yeah. like that. But before we get into like the, the foods and the recipes and the benefits and all that stuff, which I know you can speak to, uh, give me, give my audience like your background, like, like what have you been up to up until, you know, the point of writing this book? Well, I was born a certain amount of 30 something years ago. We don't have to know the details. Um, no, I mean, I, I look, I've been sort of a health and fitness nerd for maybe like a decade. I have been into fitness for longer than that, but it was only really the past six or seven years that I was able to kind of like meld my passions, which is working out and muscles and learning about health and the things that I was good at, which is writing and communications and, and that kind of thing. So it was a painstaking period where I had to kind of take myself out of the safe corporate world and, and take the leap and, and start doing things like podcasting and writing for magazines and that kind of stuff, which is always scary because it's less secure and you, you really have to hustle for, uh, for your work and, and create jobs and, and you know what that's like um but it's hell yeah it's, yeah and it's you know it's fun and like it takes a certain kind of personality to to pull it off but i i feel really fortunate and very lucky that the stuff that i again love to do which is learn and learn about food and fitness that's that's really it that's what i'd be doing whether i was getting paid for it or not and the fact that i can now do that in a way that supports my life and allows me to keep learning and sharing that stuff with other people, that's sort of what I'm all about. So, um, you know, it started with uh, writing for Paleo Magazine, which I know you're familiar with. Um, and I did that for a long time. I hosted their podcast for a long time. And it was actually during the pandemic that I essentially purchased their podcast, rebranded it to my own thing. Um, that's like a whole other area we could go down. But I, yeah, and I, I decided to rebrand it as my own and kind of open up the space a little bit because while I believe that Paleo and the concept of sort of ancestral living and primal lifestyle makes a lot of sense. I want to be able to talk about more than that. I wanted to include more people who maybe maybe were either turned off by that for some reason or just weren't interested. I wanted to make sure that more people could have access to the amazing people that I had on the show. Um, so I've been doing that. And then I, I literally wrote this book um, during quarantine. So it was a, as you, as you, I'm sure know, it's a stressful, stressful thing. Um, but it was, um, it ended up working out so well because I had less distractions and I just, I just put my head down and, and wrote and, and made recipes and ate them and, uh, and got it done. So it's been a whirlwind. Love that. I see that there's like this trend in the paleo community to sort of leave the, the, the term paleo behind. Like didn't Rob Wolf do that recently? He's like one of the main dudes in the space and he rebranded his podcast getting away from the sort of the, pa the paleo moniker right yeah i mean i think it's unfortunate because I, 
and again, we're all in this sort of world where we're being forced even more than we were before to communicate online and on social media. And there's advantages to that. And of course, there's a lot of disadvantages to that. And one of the disadvantages I feel is that we tend to be drawn to extremes because that's sexier, that's clickbait, right? So people want to click on something that says you have to only eat meat for the rest of your life or you're going to die and you're an idiot rather than a more nuanced approach to health and wellness, right? Um, and I think that that's one of the issues with trendy names like keto and carnivore and paleo is that people are drawn to it and you you get to learn that way, but then also people are turned off because they're like, well, what's this caveman diet? That's stupid, that's not practical. And then they turn away from what could be a good learning experience or, or, or a good option for them, right? So I still tell people when people ask me like, what, what kind of, you know, what kind of food do you eat? What kind of diet do you follow? What do you think is a good starting point for most people? You know, of course I'll say like, I'm a meat-based paleo that also eats oatmeal sometimes, like whatever, I, you know, I do my own thing, but I still think that that, again, the paleo approach, which if you take away the trendy name is the idea of eating real food that doesn't have an ingredient list, that isn't ultra processed, that isn't hyper palatable things that come in boxes. I still think that that makes a lot of sense and it makes a lot of sense as a starting point for a lot of people. And then you can, you can do your tweaking and your personalizing from there. But you know, whether you like the name or not, I still think it, it's a good starting point. I totally agree with you. I love the emphasis that paleo places on quality quality of food, which I think matters so much yep. uh, in a time when 60% of the calories that people consume come from ultra processed foods, which you mentioned. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious how you got into paleo initially. A lot of people, you know, they have stories, you know, maybe health struggles of their own or, you know, within their families. What was, I mean, what was your sort of entry point on ramp to the paleo lifestyle? Yeah. I mean, I don't really have a good, a good cool origin story. Like I don't, I don't really think I have a light bulb moment per se. For me, um, it was more of a unfolding of like a lot of different learning experiences that kind of brought me along this path. And I guess it would, it would be, you know, when I got out of university and I hit my early twenties and realized that I couldn't just eat garbage and drink all the time and not sleep and not take care of myself. And I could, I couldn't keep that up forever. Um, so, you know, I started caring about food and I started caring about the quality of the food that I put into my mouth. And around that time, I was getting into CrossFit. It was sort of the earlier days, like kind of 2008-ish. Um, and with that, you know, when you get into CrossFit and you drink that Kool-Aid and you're obsessed with that, then you think about what are the CrossFitters eating and how are they eating? And there was sort of kind of, that was sort of the rumblings of paleo and paleo magazine was just starting around that time. Um, and so again, it kind of just made sense. It clicked. For me and when I look back at the way I've always eaten I even when I was a you know in high school and I was eating cereal for a meal and that was normal to me I still always gravitated towards um, animal protein and um, meat based kind of meals and I always loved steak and I always loved kind of eating a lot of protein um, and it kind of made sense too intuitively because I had always been into lifting weights and building muscle even when I was 16 and didn't know what that meant I was trying to build muscle and I was trying to be strong. And so I think my body before my brain knew that that was kind of the direction I was supposed to go. And so, you know, lots of kind of boring story, how I connected with Paleo Magazine. But when I started writing for them, I had access to all of these incredibly smart people, the Mark Sissons and Rob Wolfs and Kate Shanahan's. And I was interviewing these people for the magazine and I was interviewing them for the podcast. And the more I learned, um, I was able to kind of evolve it for myself too. So it wasn't just, you know, again, it's the drink the Kool-Aid, paleo is the best. Everybody should do paleo. If you aren't, you're an idiot. You can't eat white potato. Like, you know, I kind of got past that, that hump and started just figuring out here's the process by which you determine what kind of foods work for you. Here's how you figure that stuff out. Um, and knowing that it's also sort of like a lifelong journey too. It's not like you, you pick a diet, it works for you. And then you never change from that for the rest of your life. Cause you're changing and your situations change and your goals change. So it was kind of a acknowledgement that this was like, all right, this is my life now. This is a lifelong process. I'm going to be, I'm going to like it. Like I'm going to be positive about it. This is an adventure. Every, every time I experimented with a diet or a type of um, like workout plan or whatever, I just kind of was like, this is fun. This is cool. I get to do this. I get to learn and learn about myself and then take what I've learned and move on and maybe share it with other people. And that's, you know, still what I'm doing. 
That's awesome. I can totally relate to that. And I also love your, your seemingly lifelong appreciation for animal protein. Like there, I get so happy inside if I'm at a restaurant and I look over and across the way, there's like a table of women and like, you know, they're enjoying like a big steak or something like that, you know, because I feel like so many times women deprive themselves of really nourishing foods. You know, they eat, they'll eat like something really small and dainty either because they think it's like more feminine or because it's like, you know, perhaps more dietetic or something, you know, I mean, I don't know the thought process, uh, but, um, but I just love that. I love like, I just love seeing women that can like enjoy a good steak. Me too. And, and I do think that it is one of those things where we've been taught like commercial after commercial of women laughing with yogurt and like smiling with a salad that it's going to take a long time for us to unlearn that stuff because I still get it all the time. I have women coming to me that are saying, I want to build muscle, but I have to be in a caloric deficit. I can't eat too much meat because that's heavy and that's going to make me bulky and like those things. And these are from people who are already into health and wellness. So it's not like they're complete beginners. These are really, really pervasive um, concepts that take a long time to to get over. And the only way that I found that I can help because it's really frustrating to me is to just keep sort of living by example and doing the things that I think are, are right. And um, thriving the best way that I can. And when people come to me and say like, what are you doing? Like, how are, you know, how are you working out? How are you eating? And I share that information with them. Like I'll have women come up to me in the gym and they're like, Hey, like, what do you do to work out? Because I really want to build more muscle, but I'm so scared of being bulky. And I always tell them, I'm like, Hey, you know, tell me the truth. Do you think I'm bulky? Like I'm, a, I'm presuming you don't, or else you wouldn't come up to me. And they're like, no, no, you look great. You've got great muscle. And I'm like, I eat meat every day. <laughs> And I try so hard to lift the heaviest weight I can. And this is, this is what I come up with. This is the best I can do. <laughs> so I promise you that you will not accidentally get bulky. But again, it's just something that I think people need to hear over and over the way they've heard the bad stuff over and over, you know? Yeah. And some women like to pack on muscle, you know, it's like a goal that they're going for. And like, that's totally fine as well. But yep. you're right in that it's very hard to put on muscle. It's a lifelong process. I mean, I've been lifting weights for, you know, 20 years at this point. And look at me, I'm not like, you know, like some of these Instagram guys that you see with like 12 pack abs or anything like that. It's like really hard. It's hard and also a lot men. of people that you see on social media are taking other things, women Absolutely. included. Absolutely. I mean, especially women at this point. Like I think my, my um, foray into the bodybuilding world taught me that, that uh, it's at least as pervasive with women as it is for men. And, um, you know, I, that's a conversation we, we don't have to go down because it's kind of a whole other topic. But I think that it's, it is important for everyone to understand that, um, that social media isn't real. You can find a lot of real people and genuine advice and good things and inspiration there. Um, but it isn't real and you have to take everything with a grain of salt. And no matter how intelligent or um, authentic a person is who's giving you the information, it's still up to you. It's still your responsibility to take that information and, and experiment with it and, and synthesize it and use it for yourself um, rather than just being like, okay, this person looks good. So what they are saying must be legit, right? Amen. Okay. So organ meats, how do you get into organ meats? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, I have always approached eating because it's like the best thing in life, certainly for me. I've always approached eating like an adventure. So when I graduated university and I was moving around a little bit, I moved to different places and I ended up in New York, which as you know, is like the Mecca for every type of food you could ever want to eat, right? So when I was living there, I was trying all kinds of different cuisines and ethnic foods and everything I could get my hands on. And when I went to a restaurant and there was something that I hadn't tried before, instead of thinking like, oh, okay, that's weird. That's, I'm not into it. I've never tried it. I was like, okay, that's weird. Like bring that over. I want to try it. <laughs> and so I was trying all kinds of different meats and cuts and types of meats and types of food. And I realized that while maybe I did it at first to kind of like be adventurous and, and have an exciting experience, I actually really enjoyed them. And I felt good when I was eating different animals, different types of animals, different cuts and things like that. Um, and so from there, and then at the same time, I was getting into paleo and I was caring about how much protein I was eating for, for muscle building and all of those things. And I just started learning and I just understood that organ meats are ounce for ounce, so incredibly nutrient dense and the most nutrient dense foods you can eat 
that again, it just makes sense. Like if I want to maximize, if I'm going to be eating animal protein and I want to maximize my health and the health benefits that I'm getting from it, it just makes sense. So I started kind of like dabbling and experimenting with easy stuff and simple stuff. And like I said, people were kind of reaching out to me and for every person who did like the barf emoji, there was a person who was like, whoa, what are you doing? Like, I want to try that. And then there'd be people who would message me that were maybe hunters who were already on board with the nose to tail thing. Cause obviously that makes sense. And they'd be like, Hey, I have a great heart recipe for you. Why don't you try this? And, and it just kind of started blossoming. And as I noticed that my health was dramatically improving, I thought, let's see if we can change the conversation from this is off the table to it doesn't have to be something you choke down just because it's healthy to let's let's make this fun let's make this interesting let's make this exciting we can find ways to enjoy it and also improve our health and also um, support a better healthier more ethical food system at the same time i mean it's a win-win-win across the board as far as i'm concerned so uh yeah very passionate That's about it i love that there's two i would say that there's two key barriers to entry though right like yeah. when tipping your toe into the organ meat pool. There's like the taste, which can be very strong. And there's also the mouth feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Texture and taste. Yeah. Um, texture and so, taste. I mean, I've got, I've got answers to all of these, as you can imagine, um, because this, these are like the, the challenges and the questions I get all the time. I mean, there's a couple things. So with texture first, there's so many ways you can approach this one being hide it hide organ meats in other foods so that you're getting the health benefits and you don't have to worry about the textural issue. So like your mom used to hide the pill crushed up into some yogurt when you were sick, you know, or like your parents would hide the broccoli under some cheese. Like, it's fine. You can do that if you want. You can, um, you know, do the sort of four to one ratio of ground beef to ground heart and kidney and liver. And your butcher can do that for you. So you don't even have to deal with it. And then you've got ground meat that you can make your meatballs or burgers with. And if you do the right ratio, you're not really tasting anything different, but you're getting a like supercharged burger that you'd already be making. Right. So that's one option. Another thing you can do if you are worried about texture is go for organ meats that are also muscle meat. So things like heart, um, it's a muscle. So just like the, um, shank or the steak or the tea, whatever that you're eating, it's, it's muscle. So it has that kind of beefy um, texture that you're already used to. It might have a slightly richer flavor again, but I actually recommend heart to a lot of people who are interested, but nervous because it's mm. very versatile. You can do almost anything with it. You can roast it. You can um, barbecue it. You can stuff it with something delicious and put it in your oven. You can do anything with marinate. I turned it into jerky. I made beef heart jerky, delicious. Um, wow. So so yeah, and you can do things like that. And then there's tongue also, like if you've gone to a good Mexican restaurant and had tongue tacos, I mean, that's like pull apart, fatty, delicious, like brisket. It's amazing. And that's a muscle. Um, so you can experiment with organs that um, don't have a challenging texture. Um, and the same goes for, for flavor too. So you can hide it. Um, you can start small is another recommendation I make. So if you are open to the idea of liver, which is generally what people think of when they think of organ meats and also what they're scared of, because it's the one organ that most people have experience with because maybe they grew up and somebody made them some terrible liver and onions and they're still traumatized by it. Um, cool. But yeah, but, but you can start small with smaller animals. So smaller animals tend to be milder tasting. So if you're dipping your toe into organ meats, you don't start with the buffalo kidney, right? Like you're going to go for chicken liver, chicken gizzards, chicken hearts, because they're much milder tasting. They're easier to find. They're easier to prepare. Um, you can turn chicken liver into like a pate or a mousse you mix it with enough butter and cream and, and brandy or tequila. I mean, it's going to taste good, right? You put it on some like salty paleo crackers. There you go. You've got something that's crab pleasing. So um, yeah. And I mean, it's also, there's, there's an element too, I think on a more serious note of understanding that something that's different is going to take some time to get used to. And I think that one of the other issues with the modern kind of food culture is that we expect all food to be, incredibly cheap, incredibly easy to find and make, and incredibly delicious. Like everything we eat is supposed to be the best tasting thing in the world. And that's not how being an adult is. That's not how being a healthy person is. Like 
like we we've accepted growing up again going back to the broccoli thing because i use that as an example all the time i'm like broccoli's gross but a lot of people i think <laughs> broccoli's gross but a lot of people get around this idea because they're like this is healthy this is good for me so i'm gonna eat something that is good for me rather than something that's hyper palatable that tastes like chocolate cake because I recognize it's worth it. So if you're going to do that, if you're going to have that attitude that food is fuel as well as pleasure, same goes for liver. Like you can find ways to make it more delicious, just like you can find ways to make broccoli more delicious. But ultimately everything you put in your mouth doesn't have to taste like chocolate cake and it shouldn't, you know, like sometimes you're, you're doing this because it's good for you and it's worth it, you know? Yeah, I totally agree. If your palate hasn't evolved since the time you were 12, <laughs> you, need to check your, you need to check yourself. Yeah. Some of the best things in life are acquired tastes, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. I, um, this is sort of like a, a funny little aside, but growing up, I was a very picky eater. My, my nickname growing up was Mean Face because I was just so picky and I wouldn't eat anything that my mom would make me eat. Yeah. And at a certain point when I was young enough to understand what she was talking about, she told me that if I wasn't more adventurous with food, if I wasn't more like experimental, girls wouldn't want to date me. Ooh, Which you could read into that. Good like, line. <laughs> yeah. And you know, what I think she was trying to say is you've got to have like an adventurous palate or you're going to be boring. And you know, like what girl wants I mean, to be a boring guy? And I mean, mother, mom wisdom, there's something to it. But it's funny that you say it though, because one of the big things that I really wanted to accomplish with this book, and it sounds corny, but I mean it very sincerely, is the two things that I wanted to communicate with this book. One, that eating organ meats is a good idea. And the other one is to encourage people to open their mind and take some risk in life because that is how you learn that is how you have new experiences and that's how you broaden your your life and your happiness so and what better way to do it than with food because it's such a low risk endeavor right if you try something new on your plate and you don't like it you have lost nothing you're right back where you started but if you try something new and you love it you have just opened up an entire new world that might be a, a completely new type of cuisine. It might be improved health. It might be you being more willing to take some of those risks and try new things in the gym or with your relationship or with your job or with where you travel. And I really don't think that that's, that's overselling it. I think that if you get more used to the idea of just being open-minded and thinking of new things and new and unfamiliar things as exciting instead of scary and bad, that's going to change your entire outlook on life. And I mean, I feel like that's done that with, with me, for me, certainly. Like the more open I am when I'm cooking and when I'm making food and when I'm sharing food with other people, that has like this positive, you know, steamroll effect into the rest of my life. So I believe it. I mean, I believe that uh, being open and willing to try new things, it will definitely get you more girls. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, and you're happy. also, yeah. And you're also going to attract more interesting people as a result. Yeah. So it's going to create this, like, I think, very positive feedback loop in your life if you're just willing to be more experimental and to ch ch always be willing to challenge those narratives yep. that you have about your preferences, you know, because your preferences, you're not the same person year to year, even moment to moment. Um, 100%. So, so, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about the health benefits of organ meats because I know you've done, you've done a deep dive there as well. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about heart, liver, tongue. Um, can you speak to some of the health benefits of including more of these organs in your diet? Yeah. So uh, a big part of the book too, because again, this, this cookbook does not have 400 recipes. I'm not a chef, so it's pretty hard to come up with hundreds of, of organ meat recipes. So it's a little bit, you know, it's, it's more of an introductory. I mean, there's like 75 recipes, there's plenty, but there's also a big section in the front that is really kind of breaking down what organ meats are, what is an organ meat, what isn't, and then breaks down each of the individual ones and talks about the health benefits, how you prep it, where you find it, how you cook it, all of those things. Um, and I think that generally speaking, most of the big organ meats that you've heard of and that you're talking about have similar kind of um, macro micronutrient profiles in that like things like liver, kidney, heart, 
They have uh, a lot of protein, a lot of iron, a lot of um, anti-inflammatory antioxidants. So things like um, CoQ10, big time with heart, but with liver as well, and selenium um, and A vitamins, good for your eye health, um, B vitamins, B12. I mean, liver has, I think it's like fifth per ounce per ounce, like 50 times more B12 than a piece of steak, um, more B vitamins and A vitamins than literally any other food on the planet. Um, and it goes back again to this is ounce for ounce, like pound for pound, really nutrient dense. So you don't have to eat 12 ounces of liver every day, thankfully. You don't have to eat kidney and heart and liver every week to get the health benefits. Um, if you're eating a couple ounces once a week of liver, like that's gonna make a significant difference in your life. So it's not a huge lifestyle change. Um, and like even things like, I've got some more adventurous organs in there, like brain, for example, which has a ton of omega-3 fatty acids, which is good for your own brain health. And it's good for inflammation and things like that. And it tastes good too. Um, and I have a lot of like- Brain? Bone. Yeah, yeah. Brain was an interesting one. So I had a harder time finding that, I'll be honest with you. I had to make lots of friends with lots of different butchers and I got some weird looks. But again, nothing that's easy. You know, if it's if it's that easy, it's not really worth doing, right? You got to put a little bit of effort into it. Um, exactly. But brain is actually for people again who like meat and who like the taste of meat. So they're not people who are like hiding chicken breast in their salads and choking it down. Brain is very. Um, mild it's very creamy so if you like a pate if you like um like i mixed it i scrambled it with some eggs and avocado and some chives because it almost has a similar texture to like scrambled eggs um, but it doesn't have a strong taste a lot of these organs like tripe is another one so that's stomach um, that people often um slow cook and stew and put in stews and soups that takes on the taste of whatever you're cooking it with so a lot of these things are actually like a lot more palatable than you'd think. It's just the fear of what it is um, that you have to get over. I, I made some recipes with blood. That was another really tough, tough one to find. And that was one that I had to sort of challenge my own fear and intimidation around. Cause I'm like, I had to go to a place and I had to ask these people for blood and they looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I had to carry this home and I had to make, and it, it, when I made something with this ingredient, that was delicious, that other people enjoyed, and it came out successfully, I felt so good. I felt like I had really done something challenging and tried something intimidating and got over it. And the, it was some of my favorite recipes in the book. Um, and of course, blood is uh, super nutrient dense and full of protein and full of iron. And there are cultures all over the world that are using this in their food regularly um, for health benefits. And that's the other thing too. Like we talked about at the beginning of this, this chat that that organ meats and, and cookbooks about organ meats is not very common. But if you look at, you know, human history and around the world, every culture has made use of the entire animal. It's really only recently and kind of in North America that we are sort of privileged enough to pick and choose the, the choice cuts off of an animal and then kind of discard the rest. Um, and to even say we choose not to eat animal protein because we can figure it out with these supplements over here. I mean, throughout history, that wasn't an option. People hunted and they took everything from that animal and made use of it. And they went for the heart and the liver first because before we had Google to tell us what was in our food, they just knew inherently what was the most nutrient dense. And so they went for it. And that's what, what, what organ meats are. Um, so yeah, I mean, it makes sense. That's what animals go for too. They go for that's the organs it. first as opposed yep. to muscle meat. I'm just curious. I mean, does your refrigerator look like the refrigerator of a serial killer? I mean, do you yes. have like jars <laughs> of blood and brains and I'm just, it's, it sounds kind of terrifying, but. Do you, do you know how many people send me DMs on Instagram saying, have you seen that, that new, that show Hannibal? And I'm like, yes, I have. I love it. And yeah, I, I see where you're going. Um, but what I will say is I, I live what I write. Like I truly make these foods and I eat them and I buy these ingredients and I eat them regularly. I don't eat liver and heart and brain every day. But I guarantee you, I could show you right now in my freezer, it is full of all of those ingredients. And I'm probably eating organ meat at least once a week. Um, just the other day, I defrosted some lamb tongues and I um, slow cooked them and I chopped them up and I put them in a pan and I made some like breakfast wrap, breakfast wraps and like a, a frittata with um, 
lamb tongue because it's fatty and juicy and delicious and it was in my freezer and they're cheap too a lot of these cuts are like you're saving so much money if you get a beef tongue it's costing you like i don't know maybe 10 bucks and it's like two and a half pounds of meat i mean it's it's pretty good and you can get these things grass-fed very easily um make friends with your local farmer and butcher and they'll be happy to tell you where the stuff's coming from and, and how to prep it and how to make it um but yeah i i, I eat it a lot <laughs> i make it a lot and uh my freezer is scary to a lot of people <laughs> i i actually had uh some beef liver today i had a few ounces i did nice. not even because i was about to you know hop onto a, a zoom with you i just i had it in my fridge and i seared it up super hot uh, i got the pan super hot threw some ghee in there yes which i find to be a really complimentary fat to cooking the liver mm -hmm. sprinkled it with a little bit of salt just you know seared it on both sides but didn't overcook it that's really important yes came out great delicious yeah that actually is um another i think kind of pervasive misconception about organ meats that they're like inherently like more dangerous or scary to eat um, because I think there's probably been, and this this is like a holdover from back when we kind of went from like traditional agriculture to like factory farming and um, organ meats fell out of style a little bit because they, they were a little bit more delicate and they took a little bit more work to like store and transport. And so from that kind of came this, this misconception that they're like, you gotta be really careful about how you cook them. You have to make sure they're really well cooked and they can have parasites and all this stuff. But similar to what I think we both speak about with animal protein, which is you should be aiming for the highest quality, freshest, local, most humanely, um, ethically raised and harvested meat possible, right? And if you're doing that with any cut of meat, it it's follows that the organs are gonna be that same level of quality, right? And there are very high, um, especially with like sort of the smaller operations, there's very high standards um, for organ meat safety. So most of the time, if you're buying hearts and livers and, and sweetbreads and things like that, they're already gonna be cleaned, prepped, cut open um, for you so that they've already been very clearly inspected. Um, and then secondary to that, people think that you need to like overcook the hell out of these things to like just make sure they're you know they're safe but you're ruining it it's going to taste like rubber so with liver especially you want a little bit of pink on the inside um it's going to make it taste a lot better so yeah don't want to overcook yeah, it yeah totally i think it's so important to remind people that this whole obsession that we have here in the west over food sterility yeah. is purely a byproduct of the industrial food complex because of the way that food is produced you know, if you were to take a fish, a healthy fish out of the ocean and, you know, peel off its skin, you could take a bite out of it. You know, Absolutely. there's nothing inherently wrong with it. You could also do the same with a fresh kill. I mean, I've never hunted, so I don't, you know, I've never done this, but you could. You know, the fact that our meat today, you know, we're told over and over again to heat, to just burn the hell out of it. It's because it comes from these, you know, these factory farm systems where there's always cross-contamination. You don't know how it's been transported to the supermarket. You don't know what contamination occurred in the supermarket, how long it's been sitting there. Yeah. Um, you know, a great example is uh, of that is chicken. Like people are terrified of eating raw chicken. And I'm not saying to go out and eat raw chicken because we live in a, you know, world with the food system as it currently is. But mm -hmm. The reason why chicken tends to be the most unsafe is because it's just a smaller animal. And so when they eviscerate the chicken, you know, its intestines open up and it's like shit gets everywhere, you know, mm -hmm. literally. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not because chicken is like inherently more dangerous than beef. Yeah, I get that a lot with pork too. Like I get a lot of people asking me, they're like, is it okay to eat pork and um, pork organs? Because again, there's this sort of idea that that pigs are inherently dirtier. I mean, maybe because they roll around in, in mud. I don't know. But I mean, most animals aren't exactly squeaky clean like they just came out of a car wash. I mean, it's really, it again, it goes back to how the animals were raised and treated and how they lived and how they ate, just like us. You know, if we're living in unsanitary conditions and we're being stuffed full of drugs and we're eating garbage food that we're not meant to eat we're not, you know we're not going to be our ideal selves either so um you know i understand that there can be a lot of this like paralysis perfection paralysis where people say if i can't get the highest quality grass finished meat just screw it i'll just eat whatever's at the grocery store and i think that there's again there's got to be some nuance there and, and i'm sure as you know like i just read um sacred cow right with diana rogers and, and rob wolf and one of their kind of more controversial statements was this idea that maybe there isn't a massive difference in human health 
with people eating like sort of more uh, conventional beef maybe or like grass fed but not a grain finished versus grass fed grass finished beef like there isn't a massive difference um, and I think really what the takeaway from that is is that we should all be just trying to make the best choices we can with the resources that we have, um, the availability that we have, the money that we have, um, and when we can, right? Like it's not about being perfect all the time. Um, and it's not about if you can't be perfect, then screw it and let's just, you know, live like we're gonna die tomorrow. It's it's try to do the best you can with the resources you have available to you. Couldn't agree more. And I completely agree that uh, even Factory farm beef, which ethically I can't endorse because I know how horribly they treat the animals. It's still a highly nutrient dense food and it's gonna be worlds better for you than boxed mac and cheese, for example, you know, yeah. or any alternative. So if that's, you know, all that you have access to or all that you can afford, it's still great. Yeah. You know, it's not yep. gonna be as great as 100% grass fed, but you know, let's be real, right? Yep. About, about food access. So I'm just curious, has your, health well-being changed at all since you started embracing um OFAL? awful yeah i mean i again you, you don't want to kind of make scary claims on the internet that will tell you all your dreams will come true if you eat liver <laughs> um but i can tell you knocking on wood here like since i have adopted a more nose to tail diet and since i've really kind of um become more passionate about that approach. I mean, I don't get sick. I mean, I, I feel good. I feel healthy. I've always really cared about my health and paid attention to those things. So I think I'm very aware of the changes and stuff that's going on with my body and if I'm feeling good and, and when I'm not and, and making adjustments. Um, but I think that I have been very consistently healthy for the last few years since I've been eating organ meats. My energy is good. My um, you know reproductive health is good. Um, I don't get sick. I don't kind of get the cold and flu or, or allergies or any of these things that sort of seem to affect a lot of other people. And I will say like the one kind of corny woo woo food thing I, I say, because it's true is that especially with liver, it is probably the only food I've ever eaten that I physically feel nourished when I eat it. I mean, look, you can have a delicious meal and a healthy meal with lots of plants and animals and feel really good. Like I ate something and I feel really good, but eating liver is like that first cup of coffee to me. I'm like, I feel like supercharged when I eat liver. And it's because your body knows like it is getting every single thing that it can out of this. And it's getting all of the nutrients that um, you need in one small package. It's incredible. Um, so that's why I feel as passionately about it as I do. It's not just because I'm like, oh, hey, there's only two organ meat cookbooks out there. Why don't I jump on this bandwagon and see if I can get in front of it and make some money? Like nobody gets rich writing books. Um, I feel really passionate about it because it has helped me so much and because I want to start giving back to the system and the community that has given me so much. I think that, um, and I think Diana's talked about this a lot too, that it's, the turning away from the reality of our place in the natural life cycle that allows a lot of this inhumane and irresponsible kind of um, stuff to, to happen, right? So if we say, I don't want to think about the death, I don't want to acknowledge that we're part of this, we're separate from it, we're above it, we turn away and we allow this stuff to continue, um, where if we can turn towards what we're doing, what we're a part of, we can accept and tolerate the fact that we are a part of the the animal kingdom, just like everyone else, you know, everything else, um, we can instead look at how we can do this in a way that is as ethical as possible, does as little harm as possible, supports and, and nourishes the animals that are going to support and nourish us, support local farmers, support a better food system that's going to help more people, um, and just be super healthy and, and thrive as a result of it. I mean, I just, I think that it's, I think it's an important conversation. Um, and so that's why I'm trying to be a part of it. Well, you are a part of it. I mean, and I, and I couldn't agree more. So you wrote this incredible book, It Takes Guts, cookbook, I think so badly needed. Uh, you've got 75 incredible recipes in it. I'm just curious, are, do you have a favorite? I know it's kind of like asking if you have like a favorite child, but. Yeah, I mean, I do have a couple favorites, but one that I like to talk about because it was just really exciting for me is um, it's a stuffed beef heart. I think I mentioned it earlier, but it's 
I like it for a lot of reasons. One, because it looks fancy and like, I'm not a chef. So I, I'm not a professionally trained chef. I don't make like beautiful bon appetit meals that people will take pictures of and put on Instagram. And so this one like kind of looks fancy and pretty, like it would look really good on like your Thanksgiving table. It's a stuffed roast. And so you slice it and it's this beautiful, you can see all the delicious bacon and mushroom and onions inside. And it's like this beautiful pink beef. Um, and it looked really pretty. And then I ate it and I was like, this is delicious. Like, this is actually good. I was so excited. And, you know, I gave it to, to friends and my partner and they were like, this is this is good. Like, this isn't like, okay, it's good for organ meats. I'll give you a thumbs up. Like people really enjoyed it. And it was just one of those moments during the process of writing the book that I just felt so um, excited and empowered by what I was doing. Like it just worked out and it was good and um, it made me really happy. So yeah, the stuffed heart and it's, it's easy to reproduce too. It's, it's definitely one of those things. Like if I can do it, you can do it. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy with that one. That's so cool. So what did you, what do you have to, you have to buy like a whole heart to, oh, yeah. to make the recipe? Oh yeah. I mean, heart is not as tough to find as you'd think actually. I mean, there's definitely some uh, organs that if you want to be adventurous are going to be like more work to find. Like I said, some of these like weirder brains and testicles and spleen and stuff like that. Um, but if you go to a butcher shop or if you go to a farmer's market and anywhere there's a farmer that's selling meat, you will probably be able to find large animal hearts, buffalo, beef, um, yeah, beef. There's lamb hearts, which are actually delicious, but they're a lot smaller. But yeah, a beef heart is about two, two, three pounds. It's like probably the size of my head. Um, wow. And you, you simply clean it and you cut it and you stuff it with whatever deliciousness you want to stuff it with. You wrap it with some twine, you sear it in a cast iron skillet with some ghee, and then you put it in the oven for 30, 40 minutes. I mean, I don't, give away all the details, but, but I mean, it's as simple, it's as simple as that. And, uh, it's delicious and it will feed you for days. That's the other thing. Like, again, a big head sized beef heart costs 15 bucks and it will feed you for days and days. You mentioned, uh, beef testicles. Have you yeah. tried those? <laughs> I have. They are not in the book, sadly, because there were some limitations to um, the types of organs that I was just able to get in the time that I had. Um, but there, and that's that's another thing that like you can find. It's the Rocky Mountain oysters, right? Like there are places in America that there are still places even within America that tons of organs are being eaten, and they just kind of aren't maybe mainstream. They aren't out there in the in the restaurants, but like you know passed down family to family and different cultures eat a lot of this stuff. Um, pig feet and pig ears and um, yeah, deep fried testicles. I mean, they're, they're not bad. They're not bad. <laughs> are they, are they chewy? Like give us, you know, well, like, like you, walk us through this. You gotta learn the prep for different uh, cuts. Like I think that they generally tend to be, and I actually remember the last time I had testicles, they were turkey testicles. This was a while ago. And they're just kind of like, not super chewy. They're kind of just like dark meat, kind of turkey nuggets. Um, and I think the same goes for, for beef. They're going to have a beefy flavor. They're not going to be super chewy, but it's, um, you know, like another one that I actually have a lot of recipes for in the book is sweetbreads, which is actually a pretty common and, and sort of mainstream accepted organ because um, you find it in a lot of like fancy French restaurants, you call them sweetbreads. You give them like a pretty name and it's not as scary, but it's actually the thymus um, of an animal or the, the pancreas sometimes. Um, and those are kind of interestingly like lobe shaped, um, almost sort of look like brain um, organs that if you overcook them, they're going to be chewy and rubbery. If you cook them properly, they're like delicious, mild, creamy, just delicious tasting meat that sometimes people will bread um, or they'll deep fry, um, which you can do and make that paleo or make it healthier. Um, but yeah, I mean, all of these things run the gamut texture wise. So really it's just like, find out what textures you, you like and don't like and make sure you're cooking the stuff properly and you're, you're good to go. So interesting. I don't know how deep a dive you did on the nutrient composition of these, of these organ meats, um, but I have a supplement that somebody gave me uh, it's a, it's a, it's from a, a supplement company. They make like all, or, you know, they encapsulate basically different organ meats and it has beef testicle in it. And the yeah. supplement is marketed as a male optimization. You know, mm -hmm. I'm sure you can uh, read between the lines about yeah. what that's, you know, what that's promising. Yeah. Um, is there any truth to that? Like would that, you know, conceivably work as a, as a perf sexual performance boosting supplement? I mean, I, 
I think that there is a little bit of indirect wisdom there. Like if you, if you look at ancestrally, people would eat a part of an animal to gain the strength in that part of their body. That's, that's like ancestral wisdom, right? And if you look at, if you break it down, sometimes this makes sense because if you look again at like eating brain, for example, which is very high in cholesterol, it's high in fat, it's high in omega-3 fatty acids. All of those things are what make our brain healthy as well. So there really is kind of a direct translation. It's not saying when you eat um, animal brains that you're gonna get smarter and your brain's gonna get better, but there is actually a direct link to the health in your body for, you know, it's like same is same, right? So anyway, yeah. so I believe that a little bit. I think that if you're, if you're eating, if you're taking desiccated testicle um, supplements to improve your sexual health, there's probably more of a placebo effect than anything. Um, oh. But I, I, um, I take some of these uh, organ meat supplements as well, um, which is kind of funny since I eat so much of it. But um, I do think that that is a valid option for people who are like, look, I'm not anywhere close to buying and eating liver, but I recognize that this stuff is healthy. It's the same as like collagen supplements too, right? Like you can be eating the straight stuff, the bone broth, the bone marrow, and it's going to be more bioavailable and it's going to be better, but collagen is still a great supplement. It still can, can improve people's health. So if that's your option right now, and that's what you want to try and, you know, have some kidney supplements. If you can't stand to eat kidney, kidney is um, incredible for uh, people who have histamine issues, right? It can help um, bring down the inflammation and the histamine response. So if you can't eat kidney, take some kidney supplements, it's probably going to make a difference with your health. So I think it's an option. I do think that, yeah, there might be a little placebo effect, but if it works, I mean, hey, if it works, it works. Yeah. I'm not saying that I asked for it just to be very, <laughs> you know, just to be perfectly clear. Okay. <laughs> on this podcast, I'm on record. I didn't ask for it. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I was just giving it to try because I like to try things. Why not? I'm into it. Why not? Yep. Exactly. Whew, okay. Um, now that I've made that abundantly clear. So what's next for you? I mean, you're a wealth of knowledge. I really enjoyed chatting with you. Um, you have your book out or it's coming out or like, how can listeners uh, get their hands on it? Well, first, thank you so much for the time. It's been amazing. It was too long since we talked. I really appreciate you kind of giving me this opportunity. Um, Cause again, not everybody wants to talk about organ meats. So it, it means a lot that you, uh, you let me rant for a little bit. Um, so the book, I don't know when this is coming out but the book is gonna be in stores on October 20th. Um, you can pre-order up until then. You can get it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble wherever you wanna get it. Um, and really kind of my, my life is just sort of status quo at this point. It's letting people know about the book. It's doing my own podcast and having smart people on there to, to talk and, and learn with me. And again, as you know, kind of having a book, it's, it's, that's your, your life, you know, like there's this, this period where you're writing it, but then that's the beginning. Now you just have to talk about it for the rest of your life. <laughs> so that's really kind of what I'm, what I'm going to do. And, you know, before, um, before the, the pandemic, I was hosting a series, an event series, um, all around, you know, North America that was kind of bringing experts together to chat and eat some healthy food and hang out. And I'm hoping to start that again at some point in the future when we all feel more comfortable being around each other. Um, because I think that as much as I love doing talks like this and I love my podcast platform, there's nothing better than people hanging out in real life. So I'm hoping we get to do that again soon. But um, until that point comes, I just, just kind of keep my head down, keep working, keep eating liver and just see where it takes me. Love that. Well, I got just one last question for you. Before we get to that, what's the name of your podcast and what are your social media handles so that people can check you out? Yes. The podcast is called Muscle Maven Radio. Um, and my handle on Instagram is the Muscle Maven, predictably. Uh, that's basically the only place online. Like I, you know, I don't have enough time or energy to do a TikTok. I don't know. So it's really just Instagram, uh, the muscle maven. You can find, uh, my website. It's just my name, ashleyvanhouten.com. Um, and, uh, yeah, come say hi to me on Instagram and, and, uh, we'll go from there. Sounds great. Uh, last question that gets asked to everybody on the show. What does it mean to you to live a genius life? <sighs> Constant learning. Um, I think that when you think that you know it all, uh, that's when you start to die, honestly. I mean, nobody knows it all. And I think that um, looking at life, just like a constant learning experience, what else can I 
suck out of this life? What else can I get? What else can I learn? What else can I try? Um, that keeps you alive, it keeps you energetic, and it keeps you happy. Um, and so I think that's living the genius life, just being curious and, and always willing to learn. Sucking the marrow. That's out of it. Life. It's good so for use you. An apropos <laughs> analogy right there. It's exactly. good for you, right? Good I love for you marrow. and delicious. What is better than some roasted bone marrow with some sea salt on top? Nothing. So good. By the way, it's so easy to cook. I cooked it for the first time in my life last week. So simple. So good. And then you throw the bones in your slow cooker and you've got some bone broth. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Just 20 minutes at 450 degrees with some salt, garlic powder, tiny bit of pepper. So good. Fire. So good. Agreed. All right. Well, you're the best. Uh, let's wrap things up. Thank you so much for your time. This was awesome. To all you guys out there in podcast land, text me to let me know what you thought about this episode of the show. 310-299-9401. We'd really appreciate hearing from you. And I will catch you on the next episode. Peace. Thank you.